it. It's you know, it's and uh, we also have the uh, fire learning from the fireside chat. So, uh, well, we want to make you as comfortable as possible. Is this okay with us sitting down? Yeah, yeah, good. Um, well, welcome up to Bresti, and welcome to Serena and Christie's downtown office. Um, and to our third in the series of our initial series of four talks that we're doing for for homeowners. And we we kind of we kind of started this a while back, uh, you know, because we, you know, as as the years go forward, what we're seeing is it's becoming harder and harder to be a to be a responsible homeowner and a responsible community member in, in these parts. It's just the amount of detail, uh, the amount of things to keep track of, the amount of regulations and rules and guidelines that keep kind of, especially at the beginning of every year, it, it just, it's getting, we're in a world that's already afflicted terminally with too much information. And so every year there's this, New wave of things that we should know and and be aware of and do and you know so we and I don't think it's going to get any easier. I think as population becomes a little denser and uh, environmental concerns grow and we have sort of things like the never end ending series of climate related disasters that we see that are kind of like a normal part of everyday life now uh, fires and floods and coastal erosion and uh, landslides and things like that I you know I it's I don't think it's our the pressure on us to keep current is going to go away I think it's only going to increase am I am I bumming everybody's chi by the way landslide how many yeah, how many horsemen of the apocalypse are there uh, are there left that are lurking out there? But you know, the answer is just hopefully to be a little more uh, informed, to try and stay out that. We're trying to, you know, help you get out in front of the learning curve a little bit. And, you know, so we've been able to bring in some great uh, speakers and presenters that are experts in their own field. And, you know, anything that we talk about in any of these talks, uh, it's not like we do the talks and then you never you know, you're you're out of luck and on your own. If you do have questions, particularly as it relates to your specific property, property or let's say you have a septic system and you're just unsure of it, and you know, call. We're happy to help you track. If we don't know it, we're happy to put you in touch with the people that do, or you know, help you pull your records from the county and track it down and see what it looks like. Uh, so that's that kind of invitation is is always there. Uh, we've done uh, talks on uh, the new sewer guidelines in the county, uh, which are, are going to be a big thing for rural homeowners. It's it's going to have some repercussions through the, the near future. Uh, we've done uh, a talk on the uh, sort of an overview of uh, some of the state mandated changes with ADUs, junior ADUs, uh, uh, lot splits, and the potential to build duplex on, on lot splits and single family residential uh, zone neighborhoods. You know, there's some, you know, there's some potential impacts for all of us in that, you know, both probably pro and con for some of you. Uh, next week, we have, uh, by popular demand, we're bringing back our uh, sewer lateral talk, uh, person because everybody on this urban, you know, we didn't want to, now we, we've got an issue for the rural property owners and we want to come back to the people on the uh, urban service line uh, because they have their own sewer lateral ordinance uh, to match the septic, the septic ordinance and guidelines that have come into place. So there's a, a lot of information if you if you're on the urban service line, you should know about it. Perhaps you've seen some of your neighbors ripping up their sidewalk to put clean out, uh, uh, mandated clean outs in there. Uh, you know, it, it costs, there's some big potential costs and there's some point of sales things you should know and some things that come, can come into effect. Like if you want to remodel or add square footage or add an ABU, uh, you know, 
the trick is to not be surprised. You know, be proactive, be pragmatic uh, about learning about these things. Uh, so we're going to talk about fire insurance uh, tonight. And in, in, in many ways, of all the topics we're going to talk about, uh, to me, this is the most immediate and, uh, topic that has potentially the greatest significance in terms of cost and uh, availability and just it, it almost seems to be a, uh, a landscape that's changing daily weekly uh, I, just in the last couple of weeks since i've been planning this i, I you know i i went to you know there's how what do you think there's four or five different big insurance national insurance companies there. yeah so there's four or five biggies so i went to the, the person who's been doing my personal insurance for for many years and I asked him if he wanted to come and speak, and you know his immediate reply was, "We're we're out of we're out of the fire insurance business. We're not writing any more of those policies. I don't have much to say about it." So you know that was a kind of a clue that you know you know some things had had changed. And I was uh, spending time with another client. Uh, we're listing a property up at Body Do, and you know they they have. Current, you know, I was surprised to know that they have their current insurance with one of the other big companies. And, uh, you know, despite the fact that they're in a pretty sensitive fire zone up there where they're at. And so no problem. He's he's got it currently covered. And then the, the magic question is, well, will your insurer insure for the next person who buys the house? What happens then? And, you know, he, he doesn't know. So I asked him to call, and the answer was that the, that insurer will not insure that property again. And the likelihood is that uh, the fair plan will be the only option, and the insurance on the property will go from about $1,900 uh, uh, a year to $6,500 a year. So, and then just to, you know, talk to clients, and some of them are, Bullish on this is the best insurance company to go to because I got good insurance from them. These are the worst people because they canceled me. Uh, you know, everybody's got an interaction with an insurance company, and, and as I check this out more and more, all of all of the companies, all of the big companies, are going are through their own challenges and struggle with this uh, issue. There's not one company that writes policies everywhere, and another company that doesn't because I had consistently have people tell me how they got canceled by this company and got insurance with this one, but someone else will, it'll be flip-flop. So you can't take insurance for granted. I was talking, Doug and I were talking uh, just a minute ago. In the old days, you waited until two days before the close of escrow, you called your insurance person and they, they wrote up a quick binder and you're covered, no worry. You, you know, those days are, are gone. And so we, we, oh, we had a, I talked, I had dinner with another set of clients the other night. And, and, uh, you know, one of the questions they asked was, well, gosh, we have gone through the trouble to form a firewise community with our neighbors. We've gone, done tremendous amounts of work, gone through lots of effort to make the whole neighborhood safer as well as our own property. Why isn't that reflected? In, in a reduction uh, in the in the price of our insurance, is, is there some mechanism that can account for that or will account for that? You know, if, if there is, it's it's not very much, and it's not equal to the amount of effort and time and cost that was put into um, uh, making their be part of that firewise community. So, two percent. Yeah. Well, it's, I, it's all over the map, and, and uh, I think some of the answers for the future, or at least some of the mitigations in terms of cost and uh, uh, availability, are going to have to come from the level of the insurance commissioner uh, of the state of California, and that's where some pressure has to be put to to you know factor in things like the work that people do to make make their homes safe and, and less risky. 
So anyway, that's my spiel. That's my two cents. Uh, if you, yeah, I'm going to introduce Henry Tetson, uh, who is a farmer's agent here in Santa Cruz. Uh, you know, uh, I could for Bresley Associates, we're not here to sell you properties tonight. We're here to give you information and provide service. That's what we do. And uh, I know that's true for for Tanner. You know, it's it's he's been an, an amazingly uh, really helpful in terms of helping to keep us educated as this whole thing changes very very rapidly. So that's the purpose of tonight is to tap into his expertise and his overview of what's happening with the fire insurance landscape, so that we can all kind of figure out how to navigate in the best way uh, possible. So. Tanner, I welcome you. Thanks for coming tonight. Thank you. I'm going to stand up. I'm a little more animated and nice to get out of the chair. Um, I just want to thank everyone for being here tonight. I want to give a huge thank you to Tom and Terry and Sereno for inviting me. It's a, an amazing opportunity to get to come and meet people in our community, hopefully answer some questions that you have. Um, and my goal is just to be a resource. You know, whether or not I work with you, that doesn't matter. I want to be able to give you advice and give you the knowledge that I have from doing this day in, day out. So, I want to tell you just a little bit about our agency. So, we are farmers agents. So, it's the Tetson Insurance Agency. We're family owned, family operated. Uh, it's myself, my brother Chase, who you saw in that last photo, and then our mom Trish, actually, who's been a farmers agent since the early 2000s. Um, three of us together are working day in and day out. Uh, Tom was saying something just now about how, you know, you can find a story about every carrier out there. It might be good, it might be bad. What I recommend is find a agency or an agent that you trust and that you work with. The carrier comes secondary to the people that you're talking to on the phone. So, you know, one thing that we really focus on within our agency is supporting this community. You know, we do a lot of volunteer work. We're involved with many nonprofits. Um, there's, you know, thousands of agents throughout California, and when you work with us, you know that your, your you know, premiums and everything like that are going towards supporting the I mean, community we have here in Santa Cruz. All right, quick agenda. Here's what we're going to go over today. Um, we're going to talk about just kind of the state of the market right now, what we're seeing in the fire insurance world. We're going to talk about what it costs to rebuild in the Santa Cruz area, and then the time frame it takes to get a policy in force. We're going to look at some um, annual premium comparisons. So I'm going to compare something up in the mountains and something that's a little bit more in town so we can get an idea of the differences. We're going to talk about uh, some perils that aren't covered through your typical homeowner's policy, just to make sure you don't have any gaps in your coverage. Um, and then we're going to follow it up with uh, protecting the dream. You know, I think Tom and Terry and all the realtors here, they get you into your dream. They get you into your dream home and we help you protect that dream. Um, and then at the end, we're going to open it up to questions. I was looking at the handouts on the, the chairs here and on the very top it says there's no stupid questions or no dumb questions about your home. Uh, treat me the same way. No dumb questions about insurance. Ask away. You know, if you have specific scenarios that you want to get into more detail with, I'm happy to meet with you after this or, you know, over the phone, whatever I can do to help you out. It's, it's my goal. It's it's a thing, Tanner. We're all of us are afraid to ask questions and sound dumb, right? So, is is with that assurance, we're we're not going to worry about sounding dumb with our insurance. Right, we can't. None of us can know it all, and you need to trust the people that you work with that they're experts in their field. Um, you know, I wouldn't expect anyone to know the minute details about insurance that I do. <laughs> All right, what's happening in the market? You know, we we all hear this day in, day out. I'm getting canceled. My neighbor got canceled. My dad got canceled. No one's riding in the Santa Cruz Mountains. You know, we've all heard, heard all of these things going around. So what I wanted to start out with is just getting a little general overview. So we have a lot of carriers that are actually pulling out of California and no longer writing policies in the state. You know, out of the country, California poses a lot of risk. We have fire, we have earthquake, we have flood, we kind of have, we have it all here. So it's definitely a difficult place for carriers to just stick around. Um, we have seen prices increasing pretty much across the board. It doesn't matter which carrier you're with. And what this is a reflection of is the increasing cost to rebuild. You know, before COVID, 
10, even a year or so before that, we were insuring homes to maybe $300 a square foot or so to rebuild. That's almost double, um, you know, in the past few years, just because of cost of labor, cost of lumber and materials. So we're going to, you know, expect increases on, on renewals in general. Um, I want to talk briefly about Fireline score. So this is the system that is used to determine whether a carrier can write a policy. And then the higher the score goes, typically, the more the premium comes out to be. Um, and then California Fair Plan. Has anyone in here heard about California Fair Plan? Some people really dislike hearing that term. Um, I'm here to tell you, we write a lot of California Fair Plan and our experience with them has been pretty great. You know, their claim service, their customer service, um, they've been responsive, they're on top of it. And when no one else will cover some of the homes we have in our county, Fair Plan will. You know, this is a company that was established back in the 60s. Um, it's not publicly funded. It's not a government sponsored deal. It's actually uh, a pool for people that can't get fire insurance through regular channels. Every company that sells homeowners insurance in the state of California has to contribute to this pool so that people can get insurance. So it's actually financially stronger than any single insurer. Um, I think they did a bad job with the name because by naming it California Fair Plan, you think it's kind of a government sponsored deal, but it's not. I pulled this up just two days ago from the Department of Insurance, and this shows us um, a, you know, the rate of cancellations. On the top, we see the consumer-initiated can uh, cancellations. So that's, you know, I found someone that'll do it. I'm going to cancel my policy, and they're going to get it for cheaper for me, or something along those lines. And the bottom line here, this is our um, in our carrier cancellations. So. We've been hearing over the last few years, you know, about so many people getting dropped and, and you know, it's it seems like it's been a little bit more drastic than the increase we've actually seen. You know, we're going up, but it's not going up at quite the rate that it feels. Um, as far as the consumer initiated cancellations, I was trying to figure out, you know, what's what's going on with this? Why are people canceling their policies in these high fire hazard areas? And the conclusion I came to is that every once in a while, we'll have a carrier come into the marketplace that will try to fill that gap and try to insure homes in high high fire zone areas. And they last about a year or two and then they they go bankrupt. So it's what I'm thinking is people, you know, they get kind of excited that they get a carrier that's willing to write their home. It's going to be cheaper than what they're used to. And then a year or two later, the company's out of the state. Rebuild costs. This has been a huge, huge um, topic lately. And we at our office, we do at least annual reviews with all of our homeowners policies to make sure that we're staying up to date with current rebuild costs. I have family members in the trades. We have many clients in the trades. And every time I'm on the phone with them, I'm bugging them and asking them what's it take to rebuild these days. So we're really keeping our, our finger on the pulse to make sure that we know what it takes to rebuild in Santa Cruz County. Uh, so yeah, we've seen increases in materials, increases in labor, and the time frame to rebuild has increased. You know, through the CZU fire, we've seen a lot of our neighbors and our friends and our family members who are still going through permit processes, and it's you know a year, two years down the line. So we got to account for that and make sure. You know, if you're paying for something month after month, year after year, you want to make sure you have the funds available to rebuild what you had. At our office, we recommend for Santa Cruz County a minimum of $500 per square foot to rebuild. Um, I've talked to some con contractors that are, you know, building really high-end luxury homes, and they're in the $800 to $1,000 per square foot range. Um, I think the the very minimum, you, if you went with the most basic materials out there, you're still probably paying about $400 a square foot. So our goal is to make sure you can rebuild the home that, that you have. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. So how that works is based on the details on your home. So we have these valuation tools where we input, you know, square footage, amount of bedrooms, uh, the type of material the floor is made out of. We go really in depth with the detail. 
and that uh, spits out a number and that's the minimum that you can insure the home to. So for us, typically the minimum because these valuation tools are used across the country are lower than what it actually takes to rebuild in the Santa Cruz area. So let's say, you know, the valuation tool has a 2000 square foot home and it says it'll take $500,000 to rebuild. We know that's not going to cut it in you know today's market and this area. So we would insure it to more of around a million dollars for a two million dollar house. I mean, two two thousand square foot home. Did, did anybody here lose their home in, in the fire? Did anyone uh, anyone fall victim to the CZU fire and lose their home? That's great news. We had a couple clients that did, and that was it was an intense process for sure. It's, it's an interesting thing. When we talk to clients uh, who live in Iowa or Indiana, and, and they tell us about the 4,000 square foot house that they uh, sold for uh, $500,000 or $600,000. All of us are shaking, you know, we're scratching our heads wondering how the hell could they build a house that big for that kind of money. And it's just, it's, it's different. The, the cost of building are so much less expensive elsewhere. Yeah, you know, that brings up a really good point. Um, you know, a lot of people get the cost to rebuild confused with the market price of the home. So say your home could sell for a million dollars, but it's only an 800 square foot home, which we see a lot in Santa Cruz, you know, these tiny little homes selling for large amounts of money. Um, you know, they think their home needs to be insured to a million dollars. That's not the case. What insurance is doing is we're insuring the cost to rebuild, not the value of it. Timeline to buying. So this is pertains a little bit more to um, purchases. So you know you're you're heading out, you're going on tour, and you're checking out the available homes. Um, if you're looking up in an area that you think might be fire fire insurance might be an issue, it's a good idea to get in touch with your agent, with us, whoever it is that you work with, sooner than later, uh, because they can provide you with some quotes to give you an idea of what it's going to look like. You know. A lot of times we'll get first time home buyers that are heading up into the SLV area because prices seem to be a little bit better up there for first time home buyers. And then once they factor in the cost of insurance and everything like that, they you know can get out of qualifying for the loan because they don't realize how much the monthly cost for insurance is. So we recommend really um, jumping on that early. At our office, you know, we work with a lot of real estate agents in town here and we provide quotes for their listings so that, you know, at their open houses, there's a quote right there. People coming through can, you know, take a glance at it and know kind of what they're working with. Um, the timeline to buy-in is also taking a little bit longer if we have to go the California Fair Plan route. So we have to write our fire insurance through California Fair Plan. They require that you submit photos with the application and the photos have to be taken within one week of you submitting the application. So it's kind of this, you know, juggling all these different pieces to make sure we can get it done in time for you to close on your loan. Um, you know, I would say if you give your agent or if you're working with us, you give us about a week heads up. If it's going to be something that's you know is going to be an issue, we can get it done within a week or less. Can I ask you just one question? Of course. You introduced yourself as with Farmers Insurance, but it sounds like you're a broker and you can access other companies. Amazing question. Thank you. I should have said that right off the bat. So we are farmers agents. Um, with farmers, though, it's it's a really great company to work for because if farmers can't write something, um, whether it's fire line or age or whatever it is, I can broker it out. So I have the ability to look at other carriers. I have to get farmers first right of refusal and we at least put it through their system. But if I get a decline, then I can start shopping it. So we work with, you know, probably around a hundred different carriers. So this is a good um, idea to see the differences between pricing in the mountains or in town. Um, this first one right here was sold, I think it was about six months back, you know, $765,000 home, just under 2,000 square feet, and this was a Fireline score of 10. So with farmers, we can only write a standalone homeowner's policy to a Fireline score of three. Four and above, we have to go the fair plan route and write the fire portion of the policy through fair plan. So this one was a 10. We knew right off the bat this was going to be a pretty pricey policy. So the fair plan policy alone was just over 7,000. 
the farmers, so what we do when we write through a plan is we write what's called a difference in conditions policy through farmers. And this provides coverage for things like theft, liability, water damage, and you combine that with the fair plan policy and you get what your traditional typical homeowner's policy offers. So these two combined, you know, we're almost at $9,000 a year in insurance. The second home here, um, this was a client of ours that closed on a beautiful home up on Sims Road. You think to yourself, you're like, oh, that could be borderline, you know, when you're heading up that way, you're thinking this might be an issue fire-wise, but we'll, we'll see what we can do. Um, so this was a fireline score of three. Whenever I see a three, when I put an address in my system, it's like jumping for joy because, you know, it's going to be good pricing. Um, so with this one, you know, the annual premium came out to just over $2,000. So it's a very similar home size-wise, price-wise, but the insurance is significantly more when you're up in the mountains. So, boom. Yeah, so fireline score takes a few things into consideration. Um, these are maps that are done through the Department of Insurance. And what they take into uh, consideration when coming up with that score is the fuel surrounding your house, the slope that you're on, the distance you are to a fire station, and the distance you are to a fire hydrant. So they take in those, those are the four main factors. You put in an address, we calculate it out, gives you a score, and then we know which route to go to get you coverage. Yes. Yeah, primary geography based, um, location based. Not most carriers use Fireline score. I would say there's maybe 5% of the carriers out there have their own systems that they use, um, but the majority of the big insurance companies are going to use Fireline. Give me a call, send me an email. Um, if I have an address, I can I can do it pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, if you want to check out some, some specific homes, definitely can help you out with that. Definitely. The higher the score, I would say the likely, more likely you are to be canceled. Um, we, with farmers, for example, about three years ago, I used to be able to write up to a fire line six. Now I can only write to a three. So carriers are getting a little bit more narrow with the policies they're willing to take on. Not, not like on a monthly basis. Um, I know that the mappings are reviewed at least annually. I haven't seen, you know, drastic changes in score, maybe a, you know, up one or down one, but nothing too, too extreme. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it has to be a public hydrant. That's that's what they're looking for, and it typically is within a thousand feet. Um, you know, I wish that I have a lot of clients that are up in the mountains, and same deal. They have you know so much water on their property and these different storage tanks, and I wish more than anything I could tell the insurance company like, look, they're good, they're covered, they have what they need, but the carriers are pretty strict with it being a public hydrant within a thousand feet. Is that fire line for public knowledge, or is it like fire territory? Just to the insurance carriers. Unfortunately not. And even for me, I don't have access to maps. I have to input the address and the owner information and a few different things even to get that score. It's it's actually it's interesting, you know, because when you know you're selling a home in the disclosure packet, you have your fire hazard report. And those a lot of times differ than the fire line score. I have had a lot of um, real estate agents come up to me and they're like, look, it's in a low risk zone, but then I pull it up and it's fire line 12, you know, so it, it can, it can differ from those maps. A little bit. It's, it's more, it's address to address. So I've had um, people on the same street where I've had one that's a fire line two and one that's a four, you know, a few homes down. So they do really look into those um, geographical factors to determine that score. Typically not. You would have to ask your agent. Yeah. It does not. So the one thing we were talking about briefly was the FireWise community. So with California Fair Plan, they give a 10% discount for being in a FireWise community. 
Um, it's not individually applicable though, if that makes sense. So it's, yeah, I wish that I could go home by home and cause you know, we've all seen it. You have a neighbor that takes meticulous care of their yard. They have all fireproof materials. They even have maybe sprinklers up on the roof, whatever it might be. And the neighbor's just letting it overgrown and, and it's, it's horrible, but we might have similar pricing with those two homes. Yeah. Could you, uh, just to reiterate the point about the fair plan insurance being uh, basically a bare bones coverage for very a very small grouping of, of risks, right? Fire. Yeah, so with fair plan, um, a lot of people think that it's just fire that's included. So there's a few different things included in that fair plan policy. Uh, probably the most significant one other than fire is going to be wind damage. So a lot of people that had trees down in the recent storms, if I had a fair plan policy with them, we went through fair plan to get coverage for those claims. Uh, but they cover everything that you need in order to uh, close on a loan or to satisfy your mortgage requirements is included in the fair plan policy. So that tells you that, you know, the difference in conditions policy is optional. But you just have to know if you don't have that other difference in conditions policy, you're missing out on things like liability coverage, which is huge, theft, water damage. Uh, but a lot of people that are right on that cusp of being able to qualify for something might opt to just get the fair plan policy. And then after they close on the loan and can kind of rework their finances a bit, we'll add in the difference in conditions policy. What about uh, uh, filing a claim for minor? see a five thousand dollar damage and when I get there your insurance premium will go up so much after that one claim. Is that some truth to that or yeah there's definitely some truth to that to that. Um, the most important thing to look at when you're filing a claim is what your deductible is. So, you know, we oftentimes we start at twenty five hundred dollars for our deductibles. So if you have a five thousand dollar claim, you you know you're paying twenty five hundred out of pocket and then the insurance carrier is going to cover the rest. So what we use as a very, very general estimation is we say, you know, worst case scenario on your renewal, we could see about a 25% increase from the claim. So what we'll do is we'll try to factor that in. We'll say like, okay, how many years of this increase is going to equal that $2,500 I got back from the carrier? And is that worth it? You know, if it's maybe one or two years, it might be worth paying out of pocket. If it's, you know, 20 years until you hit that, that equal mark, um, it's going to be worth filing a claim. It usually increases after just one claim. Correct. Correct. Um, would it be safe to say that if, if you go on the Cal Fire mapping uh, the website and see that your home is in a high fire hazard area, in, in their estimation, or a severe uh, fire hazard area is, I'm assuming that in most of those cases, they're above a fire line three. Definitely, so, I would say. So you would be surprised how quickly these scores increase. Um, just a quick example here. So past Tampa, all of past Tampa area is fire line six. Um, and that doesn't necessarily feel like you're up in the mountains when you're up there, right? So it can, it can get up over three pretty quickly. If, if just as a resource, the Cal Fire website is a pretty helpful website, and every homeowner can go in and pull up their own hazard mapping to see whether they fall within a high or a severe uh, fire hazard hazard area, and that that's one clue, you know, of, about the importance of your fire hardening work and, and what what could be in store for you down the road in terms of insurance cost or availability. And and those, of course, those map, maps are changing. Right. And they're in the process of revising them again for this year and that they, they still haven't come out yet. So who knows how many more properties may be included in those high or severe fire hazard areas. The way that I like to think about that is if you're looking at those maps, you're looking at the safety of your home, your family, yourself. You know, if you're in a high zone, then you're probably going to want to do some different fire hardening steps. Um, you know, while all of those are great things to do to protect your home and to protect your family, 
the insurance carrier doesn't necessarily take them into consideration. One more question. Yeah. Uh, Marika, yeah. uh, the 574 Sims was a property that you represented the buyers on, yeah. just for the heck of it. If if they had been in the same fire line zone as, as 5151 Grand Supporty, would, would they have been able to buy that house? <laughs> it would have changed. It would have changed the calculus quite a bit. It I don't know. Sure, it was funny when I saw that. Oh, I remember. I remember how. I'm not trying to put a plug in free Tanner, but <laughs> it was. It was like immediately within. I don't know, like three hours. You wrote back because I was pretty nervous because it is really close to us. Yeah, but I was like, you would hey, think, yeah. Yeah, and I was like, oh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm kind of sweating, waiting for your response, and as soon as you know, respond right away. Oh, yeah. Right oh, anytime I see a theory, I'm like, oh, we're good. <laughs> yeah, this is this is a good situation. That would have, I mean, to your point, Tom, that would have changed the transaction. I mean, that would have been the first time home buyers, you know, pulling together what they could to make it work. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's probably the best answer. Yeah. Significant. Definitely, great point. And you know, one of my favorite people to work with are first time home buyers, just because they they need the assistance, they need the knowledge that we tend to have. Um, so, you know, when people are out and about and they're shopping, I, I give them my cell phone and I'm like, just text me the address. I'll let you know. I'll give you a ballpark and then let you know what it's going to look like. Yep. Yeah. Um, I have a house in the middle of uh, for and I'm running it down. Okay. How might that affect the whole insurance? Yeah, great question. Um, so with farmers, actually, how I was saying you can write up to a fire line score of three with the homeowner's policy. With landlord policies, which you would want to change the policy type to a landlord policy, we have a little bit more leeway. We can actually write up to a fire line six. So I have some homes up in the Ben Lumen Boulder Creek area that are at a six. And since they're rental investment style properties, we're able to write a standalone farmer's policy. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, as far as cancellations go, I don't think that there's any more risk of cancellation by having it as a landlord protector versus a homeowner's. Um, definitely recommend any tenants you get in there to have renter's insurance just for the liability aspect so that, you know, if they start a fire, at least it's going to be coming out of their policy before it comes out of yours. And I remember yeah. and not just because you guys are saturated. Yeah, so that's kind of what we've we've determined is the most likely cause why we have a little bit more leeway with the landlord policies is that farmers percentage of homeowners policies versus landlord policies, they have so much so many more homeowners policies. So by narrowing down what they'll write with that product type, they're protecting themselves a little bit more with the investment style landlord policy. There's less of them, so we get a little bit more freedom to write stuff that they wouldn't take on if it was a primary residence. Um, before we jump into this, any other questions directly related to fire, rebuild, anything along those lines? What, is, what, what can a homeowner do? almost sounds like you're kind of at the limb of the fire line score. Do some hardening, yeah, that might help you. Do some hardening, that might help you. What advice do you have on homeowners? You know, I think the best advice I can give is work with someone that has options. You know, when you work with certain carriers, they are stuck. And if it doesn't fit their product type, then, you know, so long. They're not going to help you out. Um, so, you know, at least when you're working with someone that can shop around or knows what carriers are, are riding in certain areas, you have a little bit more of someone in your corner that's looking out for you. Uh, so that'd probably be my biggest recommendation. Would it, would it be reasonable to think that as, as this crisis in cost and availability grows, that the insurance commissioner will be looking for various ways to mitigate some of the effects on, on individual homeowners and that there may be 
down the line, more consideration given to those homeowners who are really spending that time to be a part of a FireWise program or or hard, far, fire yeah. hard their house. Yeah, that's that's honestly my dream. I, I hope that someday in the near future, or at least in all of our lifetimes, that we see carriers taking it more on an individual by individual basis and actually getting someone out on the property to you know, really inspect it before writing the policy just to see like, all right, how are these people taking care of their home? What steps are they taking? And in my opinion, you should be rewarded for that. Um, unfortunately, the carriers haven't quite caught up to that. The insurance industry as a whole tends to be a little bit behind the curve. There's a lot of hoops to jump through to make changes and to make things like that happen. Um, one thing, though, that the Department of Insurance has already done is they do limit the rate increases that carriers can take. So, you know, sometimes we'll we'll see a policy go up 10%, and that might be the, the cap that the commissioner has set on increases for policies in that area. Um, if it was up to the carrier, they might say, oh, we're going to increase you 80% if you want to stay with us. So there is a little bit of um, safeguards in place around that. Yeah. Is there a moratorium put on? The cancellations I thought I read about. For CZU fire, yeah. So in it was, I believe, a year, it could have been two years, that the, the no carrier was allowed to cancel in that zone um, right after the fire. That time has already passed. I believe so. Got a question online from Wendy. Uh, is there any situation in which the uh, fair plan can be denied somewhere? That's the beauty of fair plan. Um, unless it's in very, very, very terrible condition, fair plan's gonna write it. Um, they are a little bit picky when it comes to roofs. So if you have a very old roof or a damaged roof, what they can do is they can write it um, on an actual cash, cash basis, meaning that they're gonna take depreciation into effect if there is a claim. Um, typically, we wanna see all policies that we write as RCV, replacement costs, meaning even if it's a 10 year old roof, they're gonna pay out what it costs to put that roof on new and they're not taking into account depreciation. Um, so that's the only little thing within fair plan that I would say um, could make it a little bit difficult to ensure. Yeah. So, kind of a vague question, so hopefully it actually makes sense. So if you're looking five year, 10 year, 20 year down the line, and you're saying, okay, well, we're gonna have more severe drought, climate change, do you, receive more houses having to go to California Fair Plan, like all the all the carriers are gonna be like the big ones. No, we don't want to do California. One hundred percent. Yeah, I I think we're already seeing that happen. Um, you know, I've heard of different carriers pulling out of there. I won't name any of them just to not, you know, talk any any smack, but um there is definitely carriers that are already doing that. And I think it's gonna be a little bit more of mass exodus over the next five or ten years that's it yeah and i could see a time you know in in fire insurance as well as flood insurance in various areas where on some in some ways the the in, the cost of assurance is going to be a, one of the major determinants in market value in in various locations so I agree with that. looking yeah. looking down the road it's not just going to be California. This is happening nationwide. Yeah. And as these insurance companies look at their overall national portfolio, they're going to say, where's my risk profile look like? And they're going to move out of those places that are high risk. Louisiana, floods, and storms. In Florida. Florida, Florida yeah. hurricanes. So this is going to get better. Yeah, no, it's that, that's definitely true. And, you know, from the, the consumer standpoint, from the client standpoint, you know, I'm the, I'm an insurance client as well. So like I get frustrated with premiums, you know, I don't love having to pay that that bill every month. Um, but I think that we are definitely seeing carriers that are really teetering on the line of even being profitable. A lot of carriers are not profitable in the state and they're doing it just to kind of appease the, the people of California. Um, and I think the the bigger the company, the more ability they have to stick it out and to kind of weather the storm. But a lot of these smaller carriers are already starting the, the exit out of California. Mm -hmm. 
to show up with a flag in one federal context, four or five different carriers and say, hey, we will write you a policy list of that. Uh, yeah, shop away. I read, I mean, I think it's we all got to do our due diligence and see what's out there. Um, so I, I always recommend, you know, if you're paying and a pretty good amount for insurance, it's worth just taking a look and seeing what else is out there. Give me all your information and I'll give it to them and I'll laugh because I know that we just say, oh, no, sorry, we're right. We're going to touch it. Yeah. So that's the one thing that that's. Kind of the beauty of farmers is anytime i have someone reach out and they're like i've reached out to everyone no one will write my home i can always go the fair plan route that doesn't mean we're going to love the cost but you know we can get coverage and that's the most important part and i had a client the other day who was convinced that if they called their insurer to check to see whether they would reinsure their property for the next buyer that that would tip off the fact that they were going to sell their house soon and then that made it more likely that they would get a cancellation of their policy on their next renewal i haven't heard that um you know when you're talking to an agent so that person probably called their agent right the corporate entity that is that carrier they're not they have no idea what the agents necessarily do. They don't know about that conversation. So I don't see that happening. Um, that would be very unlikely in my eyes. Did you say that the fair plan is funded by all the homeowner uh, insurance policies that are written here in California? Yeah, so if you sell homeowner's insurance in the state, so you have to contribute a certain amount. Yeah, that's that's a, a good point there. I you know. I think that while we are seeing carriers pull out, most of the time they are the smaller ones um, or the ones that are, you know, up for a year or two and they might write a few policies and then, you know, hightail it out of here. So I don't see fair plan going away anytime soon, especially when it is kind of our last resort option. Um, yeah, but I get, I get where you're going with that one. And yeah. does, the, does the CEQA earthquake policy work, uh, insurance work the same way as the fair plan? Uh, is there a group uh, contribution from the larger insurance insurers to write California Earthquake? Uh, so that California Earthquake Authority is a separate entity on its own too. So that's a little bit different than um, Fair Plan. It's not funded through these these carriers. Um, but Cal I I forget the numbers off the top of my head. But I've done a lot of you know different California Earthquake Authority trainings and webinars and all that stuff. And the amount of funds that that company has would, would blow your mind. So they have they're they're really solid. If you want to get into an earthquake policy through them. Extended replacement, yeah. typically is with it. So it's it's a cushion that's built in. Um, if the carrier, so let's say you have five hundred thousand dollars of dwelling coverage. It's coverage A. You'll see the first line item on all of your homeowners' policy is dwelling. Let's just use five hundred thousand as an example. Um, if the carrier can rebuild your home for five hundred thousand, that's what they're going to do. If you have an extra, let's say, two hundred fifty thousand in extended replacement. And there's a surge in material costs or a surge in labor costs because something like the CCU fire happened. You can tap into that additional percentage that they add on. The two combined. <laughs> Correct. That you got a policy like ten years ago, you're insured for like two years for the homeowner to be on top of that. Yeah, so um, great question. These days we do have what's called inflation guard built into any homeowner's policy, not just with farmers, with all the carriers out there. Typically it's about a 10% increase in uh, dwelling coverage per year. That's still not keeping up with the actual increases and in rebuild costs. So that is something that technically is on the homeowner, uh, but you want to be working with an agency that's reaching out at least on your renewal and just being like, hey, let's sit down or let's just have a five minute phone call, see where you're at. 
um, and make sure you're comfortable with the amount of coverage you have to rebuild. you out for the amount of dwelling coverage that you had um, with that though depending if you have a loan on the home the lender is going to get those funds before you do they're listed as the additional insured or the mortgagee on the policy so whatever let's say you have five hundred thousand dollar cash out you know four hundred thousand on the home you're only going to pocket a hundred thousand yeah yeah and when it comes to over insuring a home which i think you're kind of getting that too like let's say it only takes five hundred thousand to rebuild but i want to insure my home to a million so i can rebuild a mansion or whatever you wanted to do um when we write these policies we go through that valuation tool and if we go above and beyond what the valuation tool tells us the house is, is going to take to rebuild you have to justify it so you have to work with underwriting most of the time, it's simple as stating, you know, Santa Cruz County is $500 a square foot to rebuild. That's what the home needs to be insured to. Uh, but that's kind of their uh, safety net to make sure that we're not just over insuring homes to, you know, have potential insurance fraud or something like that happen. Yeah, of course. I miss John Allison, by the way. He was, he was great. Yeah. He did, yeah. Vinny, that's his name. I hear, I hear he's a nice guy too. <laughs> Are you able to give like a percentage of increase in cost with the fair plan compared to the average policy? I know that it would be considered like a high risk, so it's obviously going to be more, but. Um, like on the the renewal on the fair plan yes. versus the renewal no, on the. Not the renewal, just if, like I, if I see my insurance rates going up, 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 mm -hmm. at what point would I consider fair plan? to see if you can have a standalone homeowner's policy it's 99.99999 percent of the time going to be better pricing than going with her 20 percent less you, you don't know you can't you go back to the slide with yeah so here's a here's a you yeah, know yeah, it was eight thousand something yeah percent. almost nine thousand dollars for a home with a fireline score of 10 versus two thousand with a fireline score of three yeah. Comparing apples to apples. Right. So say yeah. you say you have the ability, say this home, you have the option to write a standalone policy, or you know, maybe on renewal, they're like, oh, it's gonna be three thousand dollars next year. You're asking, should I shop through Fair Plan to see if it's worthwhile? No. And actually, there is a requirement with within Fair Plan that if your home can be written on a standard homeowner's policy, that's the route you should go. Great question though. Any other fire related? Perfect. I just wanted to touch on this just because of everything that we went through the you know the beginning of this year. Um, your typical homeowner's policy has a few exclusions. The two biggest exclusions that are gonna affect us in the area that we live in are gonna be earthquake and flood. You know, I can't tell you how many clients called in during the, the rainstorms, you know, saying they had water damage and I had to tell them they didn't have a flood policy. So what we're trying to do now is just get some flood coverage. If you're in an area that you think might be at risk, you don't have to get, you know, this really beefy flood policy. You could get $25,000 worth of coverage for flood, and that's going to be a lot uh, less premium than it would have, you know, $250,000 worth of flood coverage. 
So I think that a lot of people got caught off guard thinking that their homeowner's policy would cover damage from flood when in fact it doesn't. So I would say earthquake and flood, the two biggest ones to consider if you can fit it into your budget. Um, you know, if something does happen, you're going to be very thankful you have those policies. But we understand that, you know, you got to make it work. And, and we're up with people too, and we, we get it. Um, one peril that I get asked about a lot, especially after big storms like we just had, is coverage for landslides. So there is no carrier out there that provides coverage for landslides. Um, it's definitely probably the biggest gap in coverage uh, for all the carriers out there. There's just nothing available because it's so unpredictable um, that carriers are not willing to take that off. Any questions about flood or earthquake or anything? I'm flooding when you say you can buy a dollar amount. Mm -hmm. Is it specific in any way for what it's covering within the house, a basement? I mean, is there any question. So there's two categories on a flood policy. There's building coverage and then contents coverage. So if you have, you know, let's say you're like, I don't think my home's ever going to flood, but for that, you know, one in a million chance, I want to have $20,000 of coverage. You have $20,000 building coverage. And if you're like, okay, I do have some, you know, personal property down in my basement where it is the most likely to see some damage, we can add contents coverage at, you know, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, whatever you have there. So now I'm off the wall question. Mm -hmm. With FEMA, we're in Paradise Park. A lot of people have had damage. We're hearing if they take a FEMA grant or a loan that they are required to have flood insurance for the rest of their life. Do you have any knowledge about that? I have not heard that. One thing I thought, so I just had a client right before I came over here call and ask me about some, ask me some FEMA questions as well. And what I've heard is that in order to get any funds from FEMA, you need to show proof that your homeowner's policy is going to deny the claim. Um, every homeowner's policy out there excludes flood. So if you try to file a claim, they're going to deny it. And then you can have the ability to work with FEMA to get some funds. I help you out? Well, it is a great. I don't. I find out. I don't think that's the case. I, that seems very extreme to me. Um, I'm happy to look into it for you, though. There's there's the cost of living in Paradise, which is Santa Cruz. There's the cost of living in Paradise Park, which is a whole. Yeah, yeah. It's just a lot of neighbors. The confusion. Yeah. No, that's. I'm glad that you brought that up. I'm, I'm going to do some research on that and maybe get a little. Um, a little post about it or something out there. Yeah, I like that. Could could we assume that? I mean, there's got to be huge institutional pool pools of money that are backing under the underwriting for the big big insurers. Every disaster, whether it's flood, fire, hurricanes, or whatever that that creates significant loss has to be changing the risk al algorithms. So uh, uh, a serious hurricane, does that translate at some point into increasing our fire insurance rates uh, down the line? You know, that's a, that's a really good question. It depends on if what products the carrier offers. So, you know, let's just use farmers and California Earthquake Authority, for example. If there's a serious earthquake, California Earthquake Authority is completely separate entity from farmers. So farmers isn't going to increase their rates because of the damage from the earthquake. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. And then just the last thing to touch on, um, you know, like I was saying earlier, these guys, they get you into your dream home. Our goal is to protect that dream. Not only do we do that through making sure you have the, the right coverage to rebuild, um, but within Santa Cruz County, you know, most of the homes here, they're two income households and it, it takes a lot to be able to, to live here and to, to support a family. So with every homeowner's policy that we sell, we like to add in um, a mortgage protection plan so that each of the, you know, you and your spouse have some type of term life insurance that if the worst of the worst happens, you know, your family gets to stay in that house. They get to keep living that dream that you help them create. 
Um, and you can add these policies on for, you know, depending on your age, sometimes 20, 30, $40 a month. And it's just really for us, we want to make sure you're covered from every angle. We have a total, total risk profile approach when we're looking at it. So we're not going to just make sure that your home's taken care of. We're at least going to advise you on your life insurance, your auto, your earthquake, your flood, and really give you that comprehensive review every time we're with you. Oh, there you go. Yeah, total protection mentality. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that's that's the mission of our our agency. Um, you know, we we've been in this community for a long time. Our family has. We've been in Santa Cruz since the '50s, and we know. You know, we're working with our neighbors. We're working with our friends. We're working with our family members, and we treat our people that we work with exactly how we would want to be treated, and how we would insure ourselves. I'm never gonna work with someone and give someone something that I wouldn't write on myself. And that's it. Any questions? <laughs> I think we went through up through out. I have a couple. Yeah. This is, this is like uh, deja vu in a way. I, I remember uh, the earthquake in 1989 and, and you know there was a crisis in earthquake insurance that was a basically un unavailable and uh, there actually were a couple uh, a couple insurers that came in wanting to capture the market so they uh, as as long as you did all of your insurance with a particular insurer they would they would uh, grant earthquake insurance uh, under some some auspices so uh, this you know, I, I think this is part of it, although I think that fire and fire insurance issues are going to be more um, prevalent and just earthquakes, you know, come and go, you know, with long intervals in between. And I, I have a feeling that that's not going to be the case for, for fire. And uh, so I think it's going to be harder uh, to do. Is it, did this go off? It probably did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You broke it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He has insurance. Yeah. <laughs> That's under my business policy. <laughs> so, so just just to summarize in, in a way how so if you're a if you if you were a home a homeowner who was going to sell at some point in time, that you know, one of the messages here is don't wait, you know, until you're in the middle of escrow check this out your 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 agent you should be you know getting your firewind score talking to your current insurer find out uh, who's you know will your current insurer re reinsure for the next person if not be do a little research on who might so that that name uh, is there for the point in time that you get the get a buyer if you're a, a person who's thinking about buying a house, you know, this is even more important. Make sure that you understand where you're buying, you know, what some of the potential is for costs down the road. And, you know, I, th I think you have to do that as part of your due, due diligence. Don't wait till the middle of escrow and do not write a non contingent offer uh, if you have not thoroughly vetted the insurance possibilities on the home. Everybody know what a non contingent offer is? That's uh, that 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 is fraught with with all kinds of uh, of peril, and uh, so, and and then just as a homeowner, I, it's easy to go on. You don't know whether you're in a fire hazard zone or a severe fire hazard zone. Uh, go on the Cal Fire uh, website, check it out, just to make sure. So you uh, see it as the seller's responsibility to disclose that, or I mean, even if you've had the same insurance company forever. Well, and here, here's how it would work: if you're a seller and you don't, uh, you're proactive about understanding what you're selling and the, the potential to insure it. What will happen is you'll go through the whole process of getting your house ready, putting it on the market. You'll live in the fishbowl for. As people come through your house, you'll you'll get offers, you'll negotiate the price, and then you'll be in escrow. And if 
every, if everybody in the process is waiting till escrow to figure out whether there's going to be insurance coverage that's available at, at some kind of a reasonable cost, you're way more likely to lose that escrow and have to come back on the market. And I can guarantee you, if you come lose a, an escrow and come back on the market, the cost is going to be significant. You're never going to get the, the, the same amount of money the next time around. And the next time you put the house on the market, back on the market, you do have a disclosure issue because you know for sure that you are going to be able to, that the buyer isn't going to be able to insure it. And there, if you do, there's new disclosure requirements and guidelines uh, issued by the state for sellers of properties. So uh, if you are in one of the, one of the hazard zones, high, high fire hazard zones, uh, you're responsible, there's specific disclosure uh, documentation and paperwork that needs to be filled out by the seller of the property. Part of that is is making the buyer aware of that this could be a potential, you know, warning them to, you know, have their eyes and ears open to this possibility. Um, but either the seller is required to do a defensible space inspection. Uh, uh, either prior to the, to the sale or as part of the sale, uh, or there's a uh, opportunity to pass that responsibility on to the buyer who will be obligated to do a, a defensible space uh, inspection uh, within uh, is it six months or a year uh, of, of the purchase of the house. So you know, all in, in real estate, all things being equal, know what you're selling, be proactive on the information, because if you're not, the buyer is going to be in, and you're going to find yourself backtracking in the, in the course of escrow. The, 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 uh, we do have copies back there as handouts of what a defensible space uh, inspection looks like. You know, Cal, Cal Fire has been very responsive. Uh, you can go on their website, uh, plug in your address, request a uh, defensible space inspection, and they'll give you, they'll show you what, if anything, needs to be improved, and then you can improve it and then, then come back out again and sort of clear it. So then you're handing that buyer, you know, God knows uh, buyers, especially now in this market shift, are, have, are fearful about what's happening. You know, is my house going to be, if I buy today, is the house going to be worth less six months from now? You don't want to add to that fear quotient about buying a house in a rural area or a fringe area right on the rural urban interface uh, and add the fear of fire insurance and the possibly fires. You know, that's, that's not a selling point. <laughs> You know, that's not why they pay the big bucks because to have that fear. So, you know, part of the process is to help get the information that's going to reduce that fear. You know, uh, maybe your house is a fire mine. Well, it's a good idea when we mentioned Cal Fire because Cal Fire comes through Paradise Park on an annual basis yes. and we get the clearance, so to speak, right? Yeah. I guess that's us. Uh, actually, before I was in insurance, I was a volunteer firefighter EMT with France Forty Fire Department, and many times we would go out to properties in that neighborhood and look at, you know, what was going on, take some notes, give it to the owner, say we'll be back in a couple weeks, we're going to recheck it out. And I think you can actually lean on the the fire departments a little bit more than you would imagine, and just give them a call. And if you just have questions, just they are more than willing to help. And right now, what we're finding some of the some of the legislation on this was enacted, you know, unfortunately, sometimes in the legislature or even at the supervisor level or the council level in these jurisdictions, they'll, they'll come up with an idea, they'll enact the rules of the guidelines and the, the regulations, uh, and then figure out how to implement afterwards. You know, so a lot of the rank and file boots on the ground are trying to figure out how they can possibly you know, uh, uh, help or enforce the regulations that have already been passed. So I know in the, in the beginning, it was very difficult to get uh, 
specific information on defensible space from some of the fire jurisdictions. You know, heck, they were just recovering from from fighting the fires. You know, and suddenly there were regulations, and they're they're I think now, you know, they're catching up. They're finally getting ahead of it. Most local uh, fire jurisdictions are going to defer to Cal Fire. Uh, so Cal Fire's uh, that's kind of your go-to for information about this. Um, yeah, I, th I think the biggest confusion is going to come from that line. You know, we three quarters of Santa Cruz County is is mountainous, you know, a huge part of it, right? So we got sort of this the neighborhoods down on the flats, and then we start to move up in the foothills, and we've got some neighborhoods there as the elevation gets a little higher, and they're sort of at that urban rural interface. So, you know, like Bernard's house, and Carbonara Estates is is one of those areas, and I think that's where a lot a lot of the the confusion, you know, Pasa Tempo's one of those spots, Rolly uh, Woods is is one of those spots where it's it's a neighborhood, but you know you're some sometimes backing up to open space is no longer such a great uh, 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 aspect the feature of a house to that you write into the listing copy you know because it can come with its you know trade-offs when paradise park was an island because highway nine had slides and we couldn't get out you no know, fire truck would have been coming in if the propane tank had exploded and many of our neighbors you know we have houses where from the sublime to the ridiculous some of the older cabins are not insured. Your neighbor's house catches on fire in a way that, and we're so close together. Mm -hmm. And your house catches on fire. That person has no insurance. The impact on your own personal fire insurance, you don't have anybody right. yeah. to go after, right? Exactly. Um, yeah, actually, with propane tanks, that's a that's a great thing to bring up too. So that is included in fair plan explosion is one of the perils that is covered for the cause. I, you know that speaks to, you know, I started out tonight talking about how how to be a, how difficult it is to be a responsible homeowner, but but that doesn't stop there. By being responsible homeowners, we also uh, can be responsible community members, and. Uh, Carol uh, Beth, uh, who's here, for, who lives at Rolling Woods, you know, three years ago, kind of very timely, she was very, very concerned about her own neighborhood. She had, she had done her own fire hardening around her house, but most of the houses hadn't done anything. And it, you know, she was extremely concerned about that. And I, you know, this was a little bit before 2020 of the CZU fires, and we kind of saw how bad that could get. So, you know, Bernard has a, has a firewise community in his neighborhood. I, you know, we're all busy, but gosh, you know, the, as much as we can sort of educate each other, our communities, enlist our neighbors to, you know, care about all of us, uh, you know, I think the better you know, this place we live. own thoughts. I think the place to start for me would be a, a caller, uh, John Laird, the state senator. And John is, has been very active in Sacramento and has, has done some pretty significant things. And I think he would be a, uh, I mean, you know, he's been part of this community for you know, 
for a long time. It, you know, environmental concerns are one of his big things. So I, I think, I think he's been receptive to those meetings and, and that hearing that information. And, and uh, I, I think he might be a voice that could carry that message and put the pressure. It's that the insurance commissioner, is, unfortunately, it's going to be a political battle, and that's partly what's going to move the needle of that. So, you know, I mean, the question is, how do you how do you move more towards personalized pricing and also incorporate variables aside from your square footage, your geography, your house value, right? That actually incorporate additional variables. I think once they're at that dialogue begins to happen. Then people be motivated to actually take the action. I think it's starting to happen as we speak. Um, you know, I can tell you at least from our clients, that's one of the biggest conversations that I have. You know, I've done this, I've done that. Why doesn't it come into to play? So I think that a lot of people are frustrated with that. So I'm sure, you know, even with a, a quick Google search or something, you could probably find a group that's already established out there. Um, that's a great point though, and something that I want to research more on my own so that I can have those resources for people um, that I, I believe that I believe if you take care of your home that you should you should be compensated for it. You know. Can we assume that that you know? So you're hearing that message pretty consistently from your uh, clients. I'm assuming that whatever opportunities you get to communicate that up the. Up oh, definitely. The yeah, yeah. So we, you know, we have our district manager, and he's kind of our our way up the chain. Um, so yeah, he he knows our opinions on that very very well. Um, so hopefully we you know see some change, even if it has to start down at the, the agent level, um, that we can start getting it you know passed up to the people that can make the decisions to to change it. You know, it's that simple thing that even your roof vents, most older homes have standard roof vents, but now there's buoy designated on top of the replacement vents that are much safer not to catch those embers. Mm -hmm. Well, who's going to change out their roof vents unless there's no benefit? Expensive. Right. Yeah, I think that's a, a big concern for people. They're like, I spent ten thousand dollars this year in making sure my home was safe, and my premium's still going up. Yeah, common. Well, good. Well, th thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, you know, uh, we'll stay after a little bit if anybody has any specific questions. If you're interested in the sewer lateral talk, that'll be uh, next Wednesday, same time, same station, and. Uh, Mike Murrow from uh, Bellows Plumbing will be there. He's extremely knowledgeable about that. We're going to take a little break after that, but we'll come back in March. Uh, I, for those of you that have read my column over the years, you know I've spent an inordinate amount of time talking to uh, about down, downsizing and the challenges to downsizing. And uh, I think maybe it's my age and the fact that I relate to it. Suffice to say, that that on the uh, term life, I think my cost would be a lot higher than your cost. But, uh, <laughs> would be, so, but all those things that we think yeah. about and worry about at, at on the, when we're entering into the last third of our lives, we're going to have a three-part series on you know if you're considering downsizing, what should you do? How do you get started? What do you do with your stuff? How do you overcome the inertia? You know how does all that work? And you know we work with literally hundreds of people that have been go, go, gone through that process now successfully. So we've, we've picked up a little bit of information along the way. So uh, look for that as well. And if you have uh, other ideas for talks that you know, would be helpful, you know, let, let us know. We're, we're open to that. And uh, we have a number of things uh, planned. So uh, we like doing this. It's got a nice salon feel to it and it's comfortable and it's nice to be back out with people again. We do have a, a virtual audience as well. Hello, virtual audience. So we, we thank you for attending and uh, look forward to our uh, programs coming up. But thank you all. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, very nice. You, you know your stuff. Thanks, sir. It's impressive.